Welcome to another session of NFP Office Hours. I'm your host, Teresa Notari, Assistant Director of the Natural Family Planning Program at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heart of Jesus, burning furnace of love, inflame our hearts for love of you and our neighbors. Send us your Holy Spirit that we may be animated by his love and give glory to God the Father in our lives. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today, our topic is Eucharistic Revival and Diocesan Natural Family Planning Ministry. We have as our guest, the Executive Director of the Bishop Secretariat for Evangelization and Catechesis, David Spatia. David, welcome. Thank you so much for taking time and joining us to share your wisdom about the Eucharistic revival. And uh, if you would tell us a little bit about yourself and then um, we can share your screen whenever you're ready. Sure, thank you, Teresa. And thank you for your wisdom and setting this up. This is just a, a very timely topic. I'm really grateful for it now that the bishops have launched us into this multi-year uh, National Eucharistic revival. So I've been at the conference for four years um, here in evangelization and catechesis prior to that. I was in the Diocese of Joliet uh, for eight years as a director of evangelization and catechesis with a little background in um, respect life ministry as well. And then before that, I had taught high school theology for a number of years. So I kind of started off dabbling in the theology of the body um, teachings with the high school students and then kind of moved through the diocesan work and had different points of contact. But I wanted to just start with a little um, story and a little gratitude attitude, really, that um, I, I'm just so appreciative for natural family planning coordinators because I, I literally wouldn't have the marriage and family that I have now if we hadn't stumbled onto somebody when my wife and I were engaged and got connected to a natural family planning trainer. So I had read Humana Vita when I was in college and kind of had my my own conversion to the truths of the church's teachings on human sexuality. Uh, but it was really when my wife got to know this uh, NFP trainer that she really internalized the, the beauty of the teaching. And then I'd say since then, we've been married 32 years. We've got five kids. They're all in their 20s now. One married, one engaged. So we're kind of moving to a new phase. But since then, we've seen, I, I think, the goodness of, of the teaching uh, kind of play out in our own marriage and our own family. So I'm just really grateful for that. And um, because you connected the dots on this Eucharistic revival thing, Teresa, it, it also made me stop and look back and say, well, though we didn't really think of it in these terms in that way, the, the whole natural family planning mindset uh, really is, has a Eucharistic dynamic to it of giving of self, of being willing to, you know, uh, think of other before self, of offering yourself and laying down your life in various ways. Um, so that, that's really been, uh, it's been a joy to kind of grow in that and really just the, that simple realization that yes, Jesus loves me. He loves us. He's given his life for us. He's promised to stay with us always, especially in the gift of the Eucharist, until he returns. And then we receive that gift from him, and then he invites us just to share it, just to give it away. So I think that that whole giving and receiving dynamic um, has really been a, an ongoing revelation. So that, that was just a little uh, of my background, and I wanted to jump a little bit more into this national revival and the topic for the day. Um, so let's see on the, on the share here. Um, so we'll, we'll take a couple of minutes just on an overview of the revival itself and um, highlight the mission, the vision for it. Um, look at, at the basic timeline, kind of what's lying ahead and, uh, and the, the strategic pillars for it. And then I think Teresa will be able to walk us through some more concrete applications. Then we'll just open it up for discussion because I'm very interested to hear 
kind of ideas, thoughts. We're trying to engage uh, leaders and various ministries and apostolates uh, throughout the church and across the country. So this is a really great opportunity here at the start of the revival. So um, with that, um, the Eucharistic revival, it's, uh, it, we're talking about it in terms of a movement, not a program. So it's a movement of the Holy Spirit. It's an invitation to, to each of us really to think about how do we respond to this great gift of Jesus present in the Eucharist? Um, how do we share that, that news in a way that links up with and, and transforms all the work that we do at the service of his church and his mission? Uh, the specific mission of the revival as a multi-year process um, is to renew the church by enkindling this living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. Um, so that encounter, that relationship, um, that desire to speak with love of the one who loves us first, I mean, that, that's all kind of driving what we're doing. Um, I think the vision statement, what, when we came to this with our uh, planning team, this executive team that's been working on the revival for a year now, um, what really jumped out about this movement were these words that are in bold here, uh, thinking about Catholics across the country who are healed, converted, formed, and unified by this encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist, um, and then sent out a mission for the life of the world. So. I, you, you could probably tell me better than I know, like, what are all the different ways we need to be healed right now, you know, as, as a church, healed as in terms of a nation, healed in terms of our family relationships, uh, friendships, um, the ongoing conversion that the Lord does call us to, he invites us to, uh, the ways that we know, just even before the pandemic, really, how, how, how we weren't really formed properly or adequately um, in our understanding of the Eucharist and our preparation for it and our uh, living out of the gift. Um, and then what if Catholics across the United States really could be united in this deeper way by the Lord himself? And what kind of impact could we have sent out in mission together? So that, that's really where, where we see this going. Um, as both a bishop-led, in, in that sense, top-down kind of initiative, the bishops launched this, but really a grassroots invita invitation where we, we want to just see things bubbling up. Um, maybe I should say sprouting up and keep the metaphor there. So we want the grass to sprout up, not bubble up. Um, you know, wherever, wherever uh, Catholics are engaged in, in uh, living out the gospel, um, so with that, um, the, the revival launched uh, this past June, June 19th, Corpus Christi Sunday. Um, perhaps some of you uh, have, have heard of it already, uh, maybe even made it to the Corpus Christi procession. We had a number of dioceses around the country that sponsored um, really amazing uh, Corpus Christi Sunday events. And that, that built a lot of momentum for us just at the start. Um, as we move through this first year, 22, 23, uh, we've been calling it the diocesan revival year. It's really, the focus is really on leaders, leaders of uh, ministries, leaders in uh, various capacities uh, to think about their own circles of influence, their own teams, their own networks, and their own ministry. And, in terms of uh, finding Eucharistic connections, finding uh, deeper links back to Jesus, to his gift of self uh, to us in the, in the, in the Eucharist, um, to the sacrifice of the mass itself. And how, how can we have a, just a, a more engaged understanding of what really is happening every time we go to mass. Um, so with that then, the second year of the revival will begin Corpus Christi Sunday 2023. Uh, we hope to see parishes across the country uh, with Eucharistic processions that particular Sunday 
in order to launch this year of revival. It'll focus on parish small groups and family formation. Uh, we already have a number of formation resources that we've built out on our website, and we'll get to that at the end after our discussion. But um, the parish year is really going to be the heart of the heart of the revival, where we want uh, Catholics of all ages and stages of faith um, to to just take a step closer to the Lord um, and to look for ways to bring Him closer to those they meet in their daily lives. Um, milestone event uh, of this three-year revival process, you may have heard that bishops voted to approve this National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis, July 17th or 20, uh, 21st, uh, 2024. Um, so that is a whole topic in and of itself where uh, if you picture 80,000 Catholics together for several days, giving witness to the faith, uh, being formed together, uh, praising, worshiping the Lord together, uh, and then being sent out on mission back to their parishes, back to their dioceses. It's really going to inaugurate what we're calling a year of missionary sending from 2024 into 2025, um, where we want to see Catholics on fire, really just speaking about Jesus, uh, in new ways, giving witness to his ongoing presence with us, um, giving witness to his presence as we encounter him and those who are in need. Uh, so reaching out uh, with a new spirit of missionary um, commitment to the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. Um, so that's the kind of trajectory of, of the revival, where we're headed. And um, with that, just a couple highlights on what we've called these strategic pillars. This was more for the planning and visioning uh, of this. So um, the first one, Fostering Encounters with Jesus, mentioned that a little bit, but focus specifically on charismatic proclamation. Okay, so that's one of these churchy phrases that maybe this group is very familiar with, but it's just this core proclamation of the gospel. It's returning to the basics that Pope Francis has really repeated over and over again from uh, this directory for catechesis through this new ministry for catechists, that it's a charismatic approach to saying, let's, let's link what we're doing and who we are back to, the, to Jesus, to uh, the fact that God sent his son into the world for us, that he lays down his life for us, that he rises from the dead, and he's present with us, walking by our side each day, um, and that he comes most intimately and lets us receive him as food, as nourishment, while he then sends us out into the world uh, through this gift of the Eucharist. So, so uh, we do have a, a team of Eucharistic preachers, uh, about 50 priests who came together in April. They're they're being mobilized to uh, go to diocesan uh, events around the country in this first year. And that's one of the really exciting things that's already kind of moving forward. Um, so with that, maybe one of the core points that, that got this whole revival launched was realizing that the doctrine of the real presence of G Jesus in the Eucharist uh, maybe needs to be um, re-examined, re-engaged, uh, um, rediscovered. Um, so again, through the truths of the teaching, the beauty of our worship and our devotions, the goodness of a life, a Eucharistic life of witness and accompaniment of those in need. So that, that truth, beauty, goodness of, of, of God's revelation and of Jesus' gift to us is, is really centered, uh, centered to the whole revival. Um, we've mentioned a little bit the grassroots creativity. So um, it, it's not a program, it's a movement. So we've already had a number of partners who stepped forward and said, gosh, we, we want to do this. We can do this. We offer this. And it's just been, uh, it's been really amazing to see the Holy Spirit just driving this forward. Um, and the fourth pillar then links up to this parish year uh, to reach parish small groups. We see that really as a a place of great um, potential. We know so many people through, whether it's through Bible study or through small faith sharing, um, 
sessions where they've had chances to work through questions, they've had, had chances to engage things in community with others um, and to, to go deeper and take to, to move forward as, as a church, really, uh, living out a parish life um, in families, uh, with friends. Um, so that, uh, that's something we'll be building towards over this next year, year and a half. And then finally, to uh, really lift up, highlight, celebrate, and learn from the intercultural traditions that we have specifically around the Eucharist and really um, the, the ways that uh, maybe some of us take uh, the Eucharist for granted, but others of us have uh, a, a, a more elevated um, appreciation for just what the Lord is offering to us. Um, in each mass that we're able to attend um, in these intimate moments of Eucharistic adoration, which again, for a lot of people is a place where, where I'm able to hear the Lord kind of speak to my heart in, in different ways. Um, so that that's a little bit about the revival. Um, I wanna hand it back over to you, Teresa, um, just to share some of the thoughts you had as we prepared for this. Well, thank you, David. Um, and I especially loved what you said about um, the vision, including healing and, um, and conversion and um, uh, what is it, uh, unification, uh, all of those elements uh, that, that we talk about all the time in marriage ministry and in natural family planning ministry. So for us, taking, taking this initiative of the bishops in our nation, and looking at diocesan NFP ministry, how do we put the two together? Well, first of all, I wanna preface um, the discussion by saying, as you consider what to become involved in, what to create, um, how to join forces with different groups or staff in your, in your diocese, um, thinking about creating natural family planning pastoral programs that raise up these divine truths about Jesus and the Eucharist, and appropriately connect them to the truths that we know in marriage and the sacrament of marriage, conjugal love especially, and the gift of children, right? Um, that core te teaching that enables us to have this ministry of natural family planning in the church. But there's a caution that you really have to pay attention to, and that is don't oversimplify the relationship between Jesus and the Eucharist and God's gift of marriage and family life. So when in doubt, consult with the catechism of the Catholic Church and always lead with the divine mystery of the real presence. Um, everything is connected to our Lord Jesus, every ministry in the church, and certainly natural family planning uh, is one of those ministries. And, and we defer to him and, and, and um, this remarkable truth that he is alive and well with us sacramentally in the Eucharist. Uh, and also, whenever you're planning anything to strive to include catechesis, witness, and prayer in all of your programming and end your events with Eucharistic adoration or mass in Eucharistic adoration as long as you can. Uh, and, and if you, um, if the event uh, will lend itself to that. Um, and again, when in doubt, even on that, talk with um, one of your priest colleagues or clergy colleagues. Um, or uh, if you're planning something in a parish, talk with the pastor about how to set things up so that the education, the catechesis, witness and prayer can come together and, and all of it can um, end with this beautiful celebration of adoration and, and intercessory prayer to the Lord um, with uh, the blessed sacraments there. Uh, David, if you could go to the next slide. Um, I fleshed out just a couple of parallels of uh, church teaching that we are so used to in natural family planning ministry and also uh, truths about our Lord. And so just giving you these uh, four points, we look at Jesus and his love, Christ's love for his church's spousal. Don't we always teach that Christian marriage is a communion of persons and it mirrors Christ's love for his church. We say Christ's love is life-giving. And we know in our theology that God willed that marriage is life-giving, especially as seen in his gift of procreation. I mean, that comes right from Genesis, from sacred scripture. 
in, uh, in the Eucharist, Jesus sacramentally gives himself, and you know these words, totally, freely, faithfully, permanently, and fruitfully to his people. And likewise, in Christian marriage, husband and wife pledge the same. Uh, they do so, and I'm saying Christian marriage, because this is marriage in the Lord. It is different from natural marriage. And that's a, a truth that you can raise up in your event. And then another point, in the Eucharist, Jesus unites himself to his people in a sacred union. And in marriage, of course, husband and wife become one flesh according to God's original design. And we know there's so much that um, you can dive into with those teachings. And, and these are just samples. There's so much more that you can uh, create these parallels uh, to have themes for your events. So taking a look at just um, uh, a few examples of the, the strategic uh, pillars and uh, giving you some ideas of these examples. I, I wrote out uh, a few ideas. Uh, and again, I, I don't have to read the slide to you uh, in detail. You can take a look at it later when it's posted on our website and also in the video. But for example, for that first pillar of in, uh, fostering an encounter with Jesus through this charismatic proclamation, right, and experiences of, of Eucharistic devotion. Well, think of planning a 90-minute retreat, um, a parish retreat, uh, where, and I say 90 minutes because if you go to two hours, people will not come on a weeknight. This is just an example. But you could see the outline. It, it could be very easy to do this. You'd have an opening prayer. You'd have a reading from scripture followed by maybe a psalm response and then a reading from Humana Vitae or another appropriate church document uh, that unpacks our beliefs about conjugal love and the gift of life. Uh, and, and again, uh, you can have a reflection that flows from that. And the person or persons could be um, witness couples, clergy, um, theologians, whoever could effectively knit those themes together from scripture and church teaching, tradition, with a capital T, right? If they can knit it together and relate it to the people in front of them, that would be key as an important reflection. And then you can top it off with Eucharistic adoration. And I would even say in that type of format, there should always be your petition, their ador adoration and petition, really talking with the Lord, give people pencils and papers to write their intentions, put it in a bowl, you know, in front of the uh, altar in the sanctuary symbolically so that people can see that we are an embodied religion uh, in addition to a spiritual religion, right? Uh, we know God is beyond creation and yet look at how he loves creation that he took on human nature and became incarnate in Jesus, right? And then he wouldn't even leave us orphans, that he would leave us himself still sacramentally in the Eucharist. Connecting these dots can be done so easily and appropriately uh, if you just think a little bit outside of the box and, and of course, get a team of people to help you out. Uh, taking another look at pillar two, where we contemplate and proclaim the doctrine of the real presence. Well, for something like that, um, uh, and, and we say in that particular pillar, there's the example of people who are vulnerable or people who are living in poverty. Don't neglect that um, segment of the church who we need to serve. And we know in natural family planning ministry that uh, we're hitting the middle class Catholic, right? But we often don't get the, um, the refugees, the immigrants, the poor, um, the struggling working class um, population. Uh, in fact, that's been a complaint for years in the NFP ministry that uh, we don't ever seem to be able to branch out to more vulnerable groups. I mean, it can happen here and there. Occasionally, uh, we have success with reaching out to uh, whatever group is in the diocese, but um, we often don't have entree. And one of the ways to get to know the people, to accompany people, is to plan an event in one of their parishes. And so this particular um, example asks us to do just that. And I would say the notes on this one are especially important when you read this example, because meeting with the parish staff, especially the pastor, would be critical for working with vulnerable populations 
We need to know who they are, what their issues are, where they're coming from, so that we can tailor our programs, our resources, maybe even get subsidized free NFP uh, education classes for people, um, get a doctor or a nurse to be part of um, the event that you're creating. Um, and, and again, don't keep it as information only. This is about building relationships with each other and also our relationships with the Lord. So having that Eucharist, Eucharistic adoration, making it personal, um, having a, a prayer fully integrated in the event, maybe even offering confession, um, giving a very well-rounded Catholic um, perspective is how we want to go into these types of events. Moving on to pillar three, I was, I, I think, a little bit more ambitious on this example. Uh, this would be a diocesan day, uh, a, a, a full day of prayer, study, and adoration on, on these issues, right? So uh, this particular pillar asks us to collaborate with other diocesan offices or movements and apostolates that are in your diocese, or maybe even an educational institution like the local Catholic university, maybe even the local Catholic hospital through their education department. Either way, bring people together to create a, a, a day of real catechesis, study, reflection, witness, prayer. And in here, um, I, I give the, I offer the theme of Christian anthropology that emphasizes humanity as made in God's image and likeness, and including our teachings on human sexuality and our Christian response to wounded human sexuality. Because in an event like this, it is important to look at the wounds that we have regarding human sexuality, um, because we know they're out there. We know that people are not happy in their lives. If they, if, if they were happy, we would have less divorce and more intact marriages, right? We'd have less people roaming from one cohabitation uh, to uh, another and another and another. We would have less people rejecting marriage. Um, and so don't shy away from looking at the wounds that have been caused, sexually speaking, in our society, but treat it appropriately with tenderness and love and clarity so that people can, as David said, um, walk away from such an event with, with a feeling of true healing. And uh, the lights are now on in the house, right? And they know that Jesus doesn't condemn them, but he heals them. He forgives them where forgiveness is also necessary, right? And he brings them to himself in this beautiful spousal relationship that we have in the Eucharist. And again, something like this doesn't have to be overwhelming. Get a team together, uh, find out who's interested, and, and see if you can build it. Uh, pillar four, we can move on to that, uh, talks about the parish. And uh, the thought occurred to me, for years and years, we've had these mother, daughter, father, son programs, right? Where we talk about how beautifully people are made in God's image and likeness and the gift of human fertility and human sexuality, what that means. And we do it with younger children, prepubescent usually, um, to prepare them to move into puberty, right? And it's usually biology is there and talks on chastity, et cetera. And the mothers are there, there with their daughters, the fathers are there with sons, et cetera, et cetera. Well, why not turn that into a holistic event where the integration of prayer and adoration are part of it? Again, why? To connect the dots, to help even young people understand that their full persons, including their sexuality, were made good by God and that they stand in relationship to him always, always. So even their sexual behavior is a, a gift from it, 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 it's it's a gift from God in terms of their sexuality and then their behavior is that gift back to God right so that when you go to talk about difficult things later on like why we don't use pornography why certain sexual behaviors are um, uh, sinful well then it doesn't sound like just a, a terrible dark laundry list of no but a beautiful list of yes to what is good and true from God that you can always stand in his presence and, um, and adore him and be grateful and, and be proud of yourself, right? 
Uh, so taking those mother, daughter, father, son programs and uh, fleshing them out a little bit more in this way, I think would be a great opportunity. And especially if you kept it small scale in a parish, uh, working with the families, that would be wonderful. And then the fifth pillar, uh, which talks about uh, celebrating various Eucharistic uh, traditions, uh, rather than you creating events, um, take part in, in, in events that are, might be going on in different parishes. Or if they're not, talk to people in your chancery and see which um, ethnic traditions or pietistic traditions that um, maybe haven't been practiced in a long time. Uh, people might want to um, have such an event in the cathedral or in uh, certain parishes and be part of that. That's a way for you to, again, establish relationships with people, especially if it is um, different um, ethnic cultures so that you can, you can befriend people, you can understand who they are so you can properly and more fully accompany them. And then they will feel comfortable talking about the sensitive topic of, um, of natural family planning and the conjugal relationship, right? Um, it, it, it works both ways, um, reaching out and joining in um, re and receiving, receiving friendship from people. Uh, so those were some uh, quick examples. Again, I'll be posting uh, these PowerPoint slides on our website and uh, David, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thanks, Teresa. So um, maybe we needed a slide in here to say, you know, open discussion time. Yeah. I don't know if anybody yeah, has any true. questions. I don't. Yeah, uh, I, I think um, why don't we just open it up to uh, discussion uh, right now? In fact, if you would like to, yeah, stop sharing, that okay. would be great. Does anybody want to offer any comments? Um, uh, raise your hand or unmute yourself. <laughs> Janet, I knew you would. <laughs> Um, you saw me. Well, I just I'm so very excited about this. And I think you both I can tell there, Teresa, you put a lot of thought into how this could work. So I appreciate that. Um, when I first heard about the Eucharistic revival and thought of the NFP ministry in that context, I thought what a great opportunity it is, because so often NFP is just like this thing over by itself. It's like it, it, people don't see it as an intrinsic part of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so the opportunity to link the, um, all those points you said, Teresa, in your slide about Jesus and the reality of his presence and, and, and the Eucharistic elements um, to make those explicit for people when they're not getting it. I am just wondering, um, Unfortunately, it seems like maybe pastors might be like, oh, that's going to be confusing. Like, that's, that's asking too much of people. They don't get the Eucharist. We have to focus on the Eucharist. This is just going to be complicated. And so I was wondering if anybody else had any thoughts on that. So, so just to clarify, your question is, it'd be complicated to combine the two. I think, yeah, that the, that the pastors might see, it's like, okay, we just need to be super clear and just focus, laser focused on the Eucharist. That's enough by itself. You start bringing in this NFP stuff. I mean, I ha literally had a pastor one time tell me he could not talk about NFP because he wanted to get his parking lot paved, right? And so, and so it would people, you know, talking about NFP is going to turn people off. And so I'm just wondering if, if, I don't know, I don't, my bishop has done nothing with NFP in our diocese in terms of p promoting this, having anything on the diocesan website. So I'm just really at my place trying to imagine the responses of asking a pastor and I like the idea. So I'm not denigrating at all. I'm sure, just sure. anticipating yeah. that they might feel like it's muddying the waters when they're yeah. really trying to just focus on the Eucharist. Well, well here, here's the, um, 
the pushback that you can, uh, or the comeback that you can offer. And that is, first of all, you would expect in the diocese multiple opportunities for um, this type of catechesis and, um, and adoration um, happening in the parishes solely focused on the Eucharist, solely focused on, on Jesus's presence. And what does that mean? That means that whatever is going on in a parish, I would think um, a, a pastor would be considering that you have to emphasize the relationship of the person with Jesus. Um, he's not a prophet on paper. He's real. He's alive. He, he rose from the dead, right? Um, this is what we believe. And so understanding and presuming that lots of activities are going to be going on in a parish or in a diocese, you can always pitch your um, activity that you would like to do as um, not so much an NFP activity, but um, a focus on linking one's personal sexual behavior to their relationship with Christ. And to do that, you want to have good solid catechesis as part of the event. Uh, you want to have um, good prayer, mass, and adoration. What's the problem with that? Uh, you know, right? That's all you have to say. I mean, it would be the same thing if I were coming from a social justice ministry, and I want people to realize that you see Jesus, he's, he's of course sacramentally real in the Eucharist. He's also real in your brother who's lying in the gutter hungry because he has no home and he's down and out or he's got mental illness, uh, right? How many, how many good Christians walk by a street person and ignore them as if they don't exist? That's not taking your Eucharistic faith um, seriously. Um, uh, in in uh, then Cardinal Ratzinger's book, I think it was God. It, it's either it, it's either God in the Church or God in the World, um, and or the, his book on the Eucharist. Um, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger at the time said, "Why should we confine our Lord to just one moment in the Mass?" That, that when we take communion, when we receive him into our body, we, we have to let him move through us. We have to cooperate with his love to love our neighbor. So if you're not loving your neighbor, um, well, how can you even approach the altar, right, uh, for communion? And so, so I think that that's what I would do. It's not so much all your activities in a parish are going to be on um, specific ministries. It's just that within the ministry that you do, let's make the connections now. Uh, because honestly, people need to hear it. People need to know um, if, I'm, if I'm going to communion and, and um, adoring Christ in the Eucharist, and I better not walk past <laughs> that guy lying on the street. And I should feed him, right? I should give him a little money for something, go buy a sandwich, whatever. Um, if I'm being um, asked to um, have sex outside of marriage by my boyfriend, I should be able to say no, no, that's not God. That's not how God made this in His will for um, His people for how we use the gift of sexual um, activity. Right? It's supposed to be celebrated only in the uh, relationship, the sacrament of marriage. Um, so, so. That would be the pushback to me. I, I would I would say uh, this is not only what we're going to do. We're going to do all of these other things, but certainly in my ministry of marriage ministry or natural family planning ministry specifically, I'm going to try to give a more holistic, integrated uh, event to the people to allow the Holy Spirit to um, to work uh, through this event and heal people and form people and unite people to Christ and each other. Thank you, Teresa. I appreciate that because I don't know, I didn't mean if you were going to start, David, to interrupt. I just wanted to sure, say sorry. thank you because that it, making it explicit, you know, we talk about Protestants having the me and Jesus kind of thing is that I think Catholics sometimes have me and the Eucharist. Like it's like you were saying, it's it stays in that moment and not expands to really impacting all that we do. Yeah, that, that was really well put. I, the one thing that I was picturing was just 
uh, I've heard someone say one time that all the teachings of the church are connected back to Jesus, like the spokes on a, on a wheel back to the hub. And sometimes if we start at the hub, we, it, it makes us a little more interested in learning about the outer part of the, the circle and how it all works together and how the spokes relate to one another. And so it might be that th this opportunity for revival opens some hearts in a new way that helps people understand like, oh my, yeah, this, this mystery of the gift of the Eucharist um, isn't just that, you know, that moment in mass when I walk up and say amen and walk back to my seat, but maybe it is something that transforms, you know, everything I do and everything who, every, everything I am. Um, exactly, so, exactly. So, um, I, there, so sorry, there, there, I, I saw a question in the chat about the Eucharistic preacher, so I wanted to just hit that real quickly. Um, so um, Nancy asks about the Eucharistic preachers being trained and how to know who they are, where they are, what parts of the country they're in. So on uh, the eucharisticrevival.org website, um, there's at the bottom of the homepage, there's a link to the Eucharistic preacher. So it, it introduces and has a picture of each of them and at least has their name, some initial, I think there might be some initial background or we're, we're doing some initial uh, introductions in the weeks ahead. But um, we will be building out a, a kind of a calendar of events on the website as well. Here's where some of the preachers are gonna be around the country. Um, and um, yeah, so. And, and that's terrific. And uh, honestly, that's another uh, wonderful thing. Uh, uh, take a look at the website, see the resources that uh, the Bishop's Conference has put together and um, nudge the appropriate people in your chancery, right? Talk to your bishop if you've got that type of access. Um, bring one of these preachers in. And, um, and as I said, um, we take many different roads to get to the Lord, right? And um, and with any ministry, there there's going to be multi a, a multifaceted way of unpacking a mystery. You all have been called to work on conjugal love and responsible parenthood. That's a very specific calling, and we know it's a calling that takes in your expertise in human fertility and in the methods of natural family planning. Um, it's a sensitive topic. A lot of people um, might feel uncomfortable about it. Uh, and it's our job to try to help people see why it's important to live that part of life um, according to God's design. I mean, it's as simple as that. And of course, we know that there are so many uh, societal false messages that uh, have been um, developed and promoted, and um, my gosh, uh, uh, the sexual revolution, I, I've said this uh, to you in uh, other sessions of NFP office hours, it didn't just start in the 1960s. Some historians uh, name it as starting in the late 19th century. In my doctoral dissertation, I make an argument that it started earlier in the 19th century. And, uh, and, and the messages of delinking procreation from sex and delinking sex from marriage um, have been devastating in, in a negative way, right? Uh, they have been devastating to our culture because we have more and more people not understanding how to have lifelong commitments of marriage uh, and, and having healthy environments where their children can flourish and the family uh, can grow. The, the messages of the modern sexual revolution have unfortunately taken hope away from the future. And natural family planning ministry is part of putting that hope back there. And so uh, again, as I said, um, in, in any way that you can, trying to talk with your, um, your uh, pastors, um, the people in your diocese, maybe you've put together a team or maybe a team is being put together now to look at Eucharistic revival. What does that mean? Well, 
come up with a plan and make sure you're sitting at the table, right, to be part of that discussion. Uh, did someone else have, uh, I thought I saw a, a chat question come up. Um, oh, can you hear me, uh, yeah. Teresa? It says, yeah, so we already, we actually already had our um, Eucharistic Congress. We act, had it on June 8, uh, 17th and 18th here in the Boston Archdiocese. Um, because we, um, because Cardinal O'Malley, he actually had, <laughs> he thought about having a year of the Eucharist um, starting in 2020, and of course, then COVID hit. And uh, so one year of the Eucharist, which was supposed to end in a Congress, ended up to be two years of the Eucharist uh, that ended up in a Congress. Um, it just gave us more time to focus on the Eucharist, which was which was great. But um, just a just a note of encouragement. Um, it was just a, an epic weekend, um, and uh, just so many people came together on our team and to to make this a possibility. And people were so jazzed. I think um, the people that showed up were like, "Wow!" Like they just had no idea, and it just. They were so excited to be brought back together to worship together um and to like to see everybody pour out of that arena um you know as and follow the monstrance into the streets of the city um into another church like and people are like well what are we doing next like it so i so i think the good thing is is i there is um a desire i still that's still out there it's just that we maybe especially when we're tucked away in our pastoral centers or chanceries or whatever, um, we may not necessarily always feel it. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, take that as, as a hopeful, as a hopeful sign. <laughs> and I do, I feel for you, you were saying Janet, um, but I think the fact is like you're all saying that people come to Jesus in a different ways. And, um, and we really have to support, I mean, we keep hearing it from our NFP community. Um, uh, you know, they just feel like, they're left alone out there. And so we have to reach out to the different groups, you know, the different demographics within our diocese and, um, and to minister to them. And I think that's something that every pastor could hope for. I think one of the things I think that's helping here is we have Christina Valenzuela out here who with, with Pearl and Thistle, who has developed the NFP ambassador program um, to try to have a spokesperson in as many parishes as possible um, for NFP. So um, that can help spread the, spread the word and take the the pressure off the priest <laughs> to have to do that, but to incorporate the priest, but to, you know, not to leave them out in any way, shape or form. But um, sometimes I think they're just so overwhelmed and not sure how to talk about that or how to incorporate that. So that's just a, just as my two cents. No, but that's beautiful. And you know, um, Liz, uh, you just gave me the idea that whatever obstacles you may have in your diocese, always, bring it to the Lord and ask him for some direction. Even if you start small with just your team of NFP volunteer teachers, right? And you wanna give them um, a refreshing uh, day of retreat where you can focus on uh, the teachings that, again, as I said, you've all been called to uh, work on uh, with, with Jesus, right? And his people, you can focus on uh, different parts of the teachings and sacred scripture uh, again, looking at um, uh, your relationship, uh, even as a team with him, and um, have some long periods of Eucharistic adoration so that you can have silent prayer and, and just be there uh, as a team with him. Um, that can go miles. You never know what the Holy Spirit then will fall out of uh, all of you if, if you make some type of effort to even come together uh, to pray in that way. Uh, uh, maybe even um, pledging that you'll do your own individual uh, Eucharistic prayer uh, and for the ministry. So, um, so yeah, even if you start small with just your team, you can see where that will lead you. That, that's a great point, Teresa, just that, that type of discernment and just to sit and listen and um, and Liz, I wanted to say thanks for that, for the shout out about uh, about Boston and uh, everything that's gone on there. The year of the Eucharist. Um, I mean, what we've seen around the country, as you pointed out, is some dioceses already had some things in the works, um, and other dioceses are using this year as a year of planning. Um, so it's really it is 
kind of bubbling up in different ways. Um, uh, and, and yet that's, that's the other thing that we've seen that, that you emphasize is just this kind of enthusiasm that the Holy Spirit does bring and the joy that, that is able to uh, really touch people in new ways. Um, so thanks for that witness. So does anybody have any other question? I see we're coming upon our um, end of our time. Any other comments? Well, David, let me thank you again. This was wonderful and uh, a real help to us. It gives us lots to think about. And I'm sure that our viewers who will watch this recording afterwards who couldn't join us in a live today, that uh, it'll give them a lot of food for thought. Thank you so All much. All right, well, great, thanks so much. I did wanna just close with one quick quote from Pope Francis, one of my favorites. And then yeah. I'll, I'll share that link again to the website um, and a couple of highlights there. Um, so um, this comes from the Joy of the Gospel document, paragraph number three. It might be a little familiar, but um, it's one of those that I think fits really well with Eucharistic revival um, and, and really with this daily call to missionary discipleship. So Pope Francis writes a very personal invitation to each of us wherever we are at this very moment to renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ. I love this kind of phrase. It's, I think it's so typical of him, or at least an openness to letting him encounter us each day. Um, and he goes on and asks us to do this each unfailingly each day and not to think that it's not meant for us. So I, at least for myself, I know a lot of times I feel like oh, I'm busy. Uh, you know, I, I, do I really have time for my prayer commitment? Do I have time for this? Uh, do I really feel like I, I'm worthy of this kind of intimate relationship with the Lord. So no one's excluded from this uh, joy brought by the Lord. The Lord does not disappoint those who take this risk. And in fact, the Holy Father goes on and adds, you may have had this experience that when we do take this step forward, we realize that Jesus is already all, always waiting for us. So, um, you know, the, the revival starts with me. It starts with each of us personally. And it, it is an invitation just to say like, okay, Lord, what, you know, where, where should I look for you today? Okay, um, <clears throat> what, uh, what, is, it a, is it an extra daily mass this week? Or should I explore this holy hour that I've been trying to commit to but haven't? Um, so just to consider that step forward. And, uh, and then as Teresa has already laid out, just to think about different formation connections that you can make um, back to the mystery of the Eucharist and the life of the church. And this eucharisticrevival.org website, a couple of the key features of these are things that you can spread the word on right now, or you can do today just to get involved with the revival. There's a weekly newsletter and there's a sign up uh, for the newsletter there. There's a, a sign up for those who might be willing to be prayer partners. And soon we'll have, um, you know, a really basic commitment for Eucharistic missionaries who, who will commit to a combination of prayer and formation and then missionary outreach. Um, and then yes, the, those Eucharistic preachers are uh, also listed there. So again, thanks so much, Teresa, for the invite. Great meeting everybody here and God bless you and your ministry and your service to the church. Thank you so much. Let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you again. Okay. Thanks, everybody.